First one mockingjay trills the tune back, then another. Then the whole world becomes alive with the sound. Just like your father, says Peta. My fingers find the pin on my shirt. That's Rue's song, I say. I think they remember it. The music swells and I recognize the brilliance of it. As the notes overlap, they complement one another, forming a lovely, unearthly harmony. It was this sound then, thanks to Rue, that sent the orchard workers of District 11 home each night. Does someone start it at quitting time, I wonder, now that she is dead? For a while, I just close my eyes and listen, mesmerized by the beauty of the song. Then something begins to disrupt the music, runs cut off in jagged, imperfect lines. Dissonant notes intersperse with the melody. The Mockingjay's voices rise up in a shrieking cry of alarm. We're on our feet, Peter wielding his knife, me poised to shoot, when Cato smashes through the trees and bears down on us. He has no spear, in fact his hands are empty, yet he runs straight for us. My first arrow hits his chest and inexplicably falls aside. He's got some kind of body armor, I shout to Peter. Just in time, too, because Cato was upon us. I brace myself, but he rockets right between us with no attempt to check his speed. I can tell from his panting, the sweat pouring off his purplish face, that he's been running hard a long time. Not toward us, from something, but what? My eyes scan the woods just in time to see the first creature leap onto the plain. As I'm turning away, I see another half-dozen join it. Then I am stumbling blindly after Cato, with no thought of anything but to save myself. Chapter 25 Mutations. No question about it. I've never seen these mutts. They're no natural-born animals. They resemble huge wolves. But what wolf lands and then balances easily on its hind legs? What wolf waves the rest, waves the rest of the pack forward with its front paw as though it had a wrist? These things I can see at a distance. Up close, I'm sure their more menacing attributes will be revealed. Cato has made a beeline for the cornucopia, and without question, I follow him. If he thinks it's the safest place, who am I to argue? Besides, even if I could make it to the trees, it would be impossible for Peta to outrun them on that leg. Peta! My hands have just landed on the metal at the pointed tail of the cornucopia when I remember I'm part of a team. He's about 15 yards behind me hobbling as fast as he can, but the mutts are closing in on him fast. I send an arrow into the pack and one goes down, but there are plenty to take its place. Peter waves me up the horn. Go, Katniss, go! He's right. I can't protect either of us on the ground. I start climbing, scaling the cornucopia on my hands and feet. The pure gold surface has been designed to resemble the woven horn that, will fill, that we fill at the harvest. So there are little ridges and seams to get a decent hold on. But after a day in the arena sun, the metal feels hot enough to blister my hands. Cato lies on his side at the very top of the horn, twenty feet above the ground, grasping to, gasping to catch his breath as he gags over the edge. Now's my chance to finish him off. I stop midway up the horn and load another arrow, but just as I'm about to let it fly, I hear Peter cry out. I twist around and see he's just reached the tail, and the mutts are right on his heels. Climb! I yell. Peter starts up hampered, but not only the leg, but the knife in his hand. I shoot my arrow down, th and down the throat of the first mutt that places its paws on the, air on the metal. As it dies, the creature lashes out, inadvertently opening the gashes on a few of it, opening gashes on a few of its companions. That's when I get a look at the claws, four inches, and clearly razor sharp. Peter reaches my feet, and I grab his arm and pull him along. Then I remember Cato waiting at the top and whip around, but he's doubled over with cramps and apparently more preoccupied with the mutts than us. He coughs out something unintelligible, the snuffling, growling sound coming from the mutts isn't helping. What? I shout at him. He said, can they climb it? answers Peter drawing my focus back to the base of the horn. The mutts are beginning to assemble. As they join together, they raise up again to stand easily on their back legs, giving them an eerily human quality. Each has a thick coat, some with th fur that is straight and sleek, others curly, and the colors vary from jet black to what I can only describe to as blonde. 
There's something else about them. Something that makes the hair rise up on the back of my neck, but I can't put my finger on it. They put their snouts on the horn, sniffing and tasting the metal, scraping claws over the surface, and then making high-pitched yipping sounds to one another. This must be how they communicate, because the pack backs up as if to make room. Then one of them, a good-sized mutt with, with silky waves of blonde fur, takes a running start and leaps onto the horn. Its back legs must be incredibly powerful, because it lands a mere ten feet below us. Its pink lips pull back and snarl. For a moment, it hangs there. And in that moment, I realize what else unsettled me about the mutts. The green eyes gl glowering at me are unlike any dog or wolf, any canine I've ever seen. They are unmistakably human. And that relevation is barely registered when I notice the collar with the number one, inlaid with jewels, and the whole horrible thing hits me. The blonde hair, the green eyes, the number. It's glimmer! A shriek escapes my lips, and I'm having trouble holding the arrow in place. I've been waiting to fire, only too aware of my dwindling supply of arrows, waiting to see if the creatures can, in fact, climb. But now, even though the mud has begun to slide downward, unable to find any purchase on the metal, even though I can hear the slow screeching of the claws like nails on a blackboard, I fire into its throat. Its body twitches and flops onto the ground with a thud. Katniss! I can feel Peta's grip on my arm. It's her! I get out. Who? Peta asks. My head snaps from side to side as I examine the pack, taking in the various sizes and colors. The small one with the red coat and amber eyes. Fox face. And there, the ashen hair and hazel eyes of the boy from District 9, who died as we struggled for the backpack. And worst of all, the smallest mutt with dark glossy fur, huge brown eyes, and a collar that reads eleven in woven straw. Teeth bared in hatred. Rue. What is it, Katniss? Peter shakes my shoulder. It's them. It's all of them. The others. Rue and Foxface and... And all the other tributes. I choke out. I hear Peter's gasp of recognition. What did they do to them? You don't think those could be their real eyes? Their eyes are the least of my worries. What about their brains? Have they been given any of the real tributes' memories? Have they been programmed to hate our faces particularly because we have survived and they were so callously murdered? And the ones we actually killed, do they believe they're avenging their own deaths? Before I can get this out, the mutts begin a new assault on the horn. They split into two groups at the sides of the horn and are using those powerful hindquarters to launch themselves at us. A pair of teeth ring together just inches from my hand and then I hear Peta cry out, feel the yank on his body, the heavy weight of boy and mutt pulling me over to the side. If not for the grip on my arm, he'd be on the ground. But as it is, it takes all my strength to keep us both on the curved back of the horn. And more tributes are coming. Kill it, Peter! Kill it! I'm shouting. And although I can't quite see what's happening, I know he must have stabbed the thing because the pull lessens. I'm about to haul him back onto the horn wh when, where we drag ourselves toward the top where the lesser of two evils awaits. Cato has still not regained his feet, but his breathing is slowing, and I know he'll soon be recovered enough to come for us, to hurl us over the side to our deaths. I arm my bow, but the arrow ends up taking out a mutt that can only be Thresh. Who else could jump so high? I feel a moment's relief, because we must finally be above the mutt line, and I'm just turning back to face Cato when Pete is jerked from my side. I'm sure the pack has got him until his blood splatters my face. Cato stands before me, almost at the lip of the horn, holding Peta in some kind of headlock, cutting off his air. Peta's clawing at Cato's arm, but weakly, as if confused over whether it's important to breathe or try and stem the gush of blood from the gaping hole a mutt left in his calf. I aim one of my last two arrows at Cato's head, knowing it'll have no effect on his trunk or limbs, which I can now see are clothed in skin-tight, flesh-colored mesh. Some high-grade body armor from the capital. Was that what was in his pack at the feast? Body armor to defend against my arrows? Well, they neglected to send a face guard. Cato just laughs. Shoot me, and he goes down with me. He's right. If I take him out and he falls to the mutts, Peta is sure to die with him. We've reached a stalemate. I can't shoot Cato without killing Peta too. 
He can't kill Peto without guaranteeing an arrow in his brain. We stand still, like statues, both of us seeking him out. My muscles are strained so tightly, they feel they might snap at any moment. My teeth clench to the breaking point. The mutts go silent, and the only thing I can hear is the blood pounding in my good ear. Peta's lips are turning blue. If I don't do something quickly, he'll die of asphyxiation, and then I'll have lost him, and Cato will probably use his body as a weapon against me. In fact, I'm sure this is Cato's plan, because while he stopped laughing, his lips are set in a triumphant smile. As if in a last-ditch effort, Peter raises his fingers, dripping the, f with blood from his leg, up to Cato's arm. Instead of trying to wrestle his way f free, his forefinger veers off and makes a deliberate X on the back of Cato's hand. Cato realizes what it means exactly one second after I do. I can tell by the way the smile drops from his lips, but it's one second too late, because by that time, my arrow is piercing his hand. He cries out and reflexively releases Peta, who slams back against him. For a hor horrible moment, I think they're both going over. I dive forward, just catching hold of Peta as Cato loses his footing on the blood slick horn and plummets to the ground. We hear him hit, the air leaving his body on impact, and then the mutts attack him. Peta and I hold on to each other, waiting for the cannon, waiting for the competition to finish, waiting to be released. But it doesn't happen. Not yet, because this is the climax of the Hunger Games, and the audience expects a show. I don't watch, but I can hear the snarls, the growls, and the howls of pain from both human and beast as Cato takes on the mutt pack. I can't understand how he can be surviving until I remember the body armor protecting him from ankle to neck and realize what a long night this could be. Cato must have a knife or sword or something, too. Something he has hidden in his clothes, because on occasion, there's the death scream of a mutt, or the sound of metal on metal as the blade clash collides with the golden horn. The combat moves around the side of the cornucopia, and I know Cato must be attempting the one maneuver that could save his life, to make his way back around to the tail of the horn and rejoin us. But in the end, despite his remarkable strength and skill, he is simply overpowered. I don't know how long it's been maybe an hour or so, when Cato hits the ground and we hear the mutts dragging him, dragging him back into the cornucopia. Now they'll finish him off, I think. But there's still no cannon. Night falls and the anthem plays, and there's no picture of Cato in the sky, only the faint moans coming through the metal beneath us. The icy air blowing across the plain reminds me that the Hunger Games are not over, and may not be for who knows how long and there is still no guarantee of victory. I turn my attention to Peta and discover his leg is bleeding as badly as ever. All our supplies, our packs, remain down by the lake where we abandoned them when we fled from the mutts. I have no bandage, nothing to staunch the flow of blood from, my, from his calf. Although I'm shaking in the biting wind, I rip off my jacket, remove my shirt, and zip back into the jacket as swiftly as possible. That brief exposure sets my teeth chattering beyond control. Peter's face is gray in the, moon, in the pale moonlight. I make him lie down before I probe his wound. Warm, slippery br blood runs over my fingers. A bandage will not be enough. I've seen my mother tie a tourniquet a handful of times and try to replicate it. I cut free a sleeve from my shirt, wrap it twice around his leg just under his knee, and tie a half knot. I don't have a stick so I take my remaining arrow and insert it in, the, it in the knot, twisting as tightly as I dare. It's risky business. Peter may end up losing his leg. But when I weigh this against him losing his life, what alternative do I have? I bandage the wound in the rest of my shirt and lie down with him. Don't go to sleep, I tell him. I'm not sure if this is exactly medical protocol, but I'm terrified that if he drifts off, he'll never wake again. Are you cold? he asks. He unzips his jacket, and I press against him as he fastens it around me. It's a bit warmer, sharing our body heat inside my double layer of jackets, but the night is young. The temperature will continue to drop. Even now, I can feel the cornucopia, which burned so when I first climbed it, slowly turning to ice. Cato may win this thing yet, I whisper to Peta. Don't you believe it, he says, pulling up my hood. 
but he's shaking harder than I am.